to introduce the speakers. Um, Vanya and Paul. Uh, Max spoke with us this uh, morning uh, in letters. Um, Ivana, you know, know, as the organizer of the event together with Frank and Alicia. I am Lenslava, I'm professor of European integration here, and I must tell you, I am the one, I'm one of those persons who were educated by the true believers in European integration and everything that's good and all right. And, um, yeah, so now this is quite a different approach to law in general, and I'm quite new to this field, so apologies if I do not always use the exact terminology. Um, that said, um, diamonds, um, or this session on labor, I, I think we will talk a bit about uh, the extent to which forms of work um, in general, oh, legal infrastructure to colonialism, um, also the role of science, I think the role of international law, but that's by Vanya, I uh, presume, also yeah, sort of shows how um, a racialized view of the world and colonialism still um, permeates the international legal framework. And Ivana is uh, going to uh, say a few words on care work um, and takes a presumably gender perspective to do that in the labor market. Diamond, can I ask you to? It was it was difficult to separate out. I was speaking about methods and then speaking about labor, and <laughs> um, as, as similar with Rob, but for me, the two very much overlap. Um, so we were asked to um, think about how themes of the workshop relate to our work um, and um, in the context of labour law. Um, so some of what I'm going to be doing is um, talking about labour law scholarship and its traditions and how it, its traditions come from a very particular place and so on necessarily open to some of these questions uh, about gender and race. So the mainstream tradition in labour law scholarship, um, so Ruth Dukes wrote a very nice piece in FC Collection on um, critical legal theory that was published a couple of years ago about critical, the traditions of critical labour law scholarship. And, um, and so she says something similar here, that the mainstream tradition in labour law scholarship has long been, if not Marxist, then critical. Um, so, um, what one might mean by critical is, is very much open uh, for, for question analysis, so I think it might be helpful for me just to say what I think I mean by critical, um, and that is, um, sorry, I just lost my place. Um, Um, and that's, a, uh, okay, so I'm going to be tautologist here, uh, critical as in a methodological commitment to critique, um, which is that um, moving away from work, just which is just based on exposition and exegesis or scientific elaboration, uh, moving away from mere legal dogmatics, uh, considering background norms and power asymmetries. So for example, along not necessarily in the labor law context along lines of race or gender, but along um, in terms of economic power imbalances. So that has been part of the critical tradition of labor law. Um, but it's, it's as, as I hope I'll be able to expand, it's not really been sufficient and that it's um, broader potential, it's emancipatory potential, labor law's emancipatory potential, it's revolutionary potential has been blunted because as a mode of scholarship, it's been very much grounded in political economy of hegemonic states of the global north. And it's been tied to um, the regulation of primarily borders productive relations with all kinds of assumptions, presupposing formal work, um, the presence of a state with capacity to regulate, um, work regulate within a territorially bounded labour market, presupposes worker agency expressed through institutional forms, in particular trade unions. So, um, so to a great extent, 
labor law scholarship has emerged from certain kind of political economy, but only the political economy of those very kind of hegemonic uh, industrialized states, of the global north. Um, so part of what I think might be useful to do in my sort of few minutes is to challenge some of that uh, labor laws. <laughs> didn't record that pause. Um, and so the claim I wish to make here is that race is embedded in the legal form by which labour is regulated. And I hope to explain what I mean by that in a minute. And that contemporary modes of work own their organisational form to histories of racial thinking. Um, so what I want to do, I'm going to use a specific example of exploring race and legal form of the standard employment relation. But before that, I need to make sense of what I'm referring to as what I'm going to call the regional constitution of labour markets and the labour contract. Um, so, as I said, um, labour law has had this critical tradition, but it has focused the, the kind of background norms that have been the preoccupation of labour studies, labour law scholars have been has been the capital labor fault line which is absolutely fine but it does it does underplay other fault lines that we might want to take into account which are also configuring the uh, are also important to the legal form which is regulating uh, work relations um so I'm using the term juridical or legal form to refer to historically specific ways in which social relations, um, specific technologies and techniques which social relations assume in the context of capitalism. And so in the labour context, what became um, in the mid 20th century, the dominant legal form in industrialized economies for governing work relations, the standard employment relation provides a historically specific and regionally specific mode for capturing and encoding social and economic relations of labour within market economy, market economy which happens to be a capitalist economy. Um, so those economic relations are captured and can be seen by legal discourse um, when they take the form of legal relations between individual subjects. So, I mean, this should be familiar to those of us who uh, kind of educate in doctrinal system in that, for instance, when one individual or organization causes harm to another, well, how does the law see it? It might see it in the form of a delict, a tort, it might see it um, using the language of criminal liability or civil liability. Okay, so in these particular economic relations are captured and can only be seen by legal discourse when they take the form of legal relations between individual subjects. And with respect to standard employment relation, that takes the shape of the contract for employment governing a bilateral relation between worker and employing entity. And I'm not using the term employer because that's just that's just too narrow. It's not it just doesn't cover the range of parties that might be on the other side. So structure around a normative model of employment premised on a gender division of labor which had initially emerged through industrialization, the contemporary gender contract underpinning the standard employment relationship is that of a male breadwinner in receipt of a family or social wage and a female caregiver. So Ivana's work has been really, really helpful on this. That even when you have women engaged in paid work, what is typically happening is they are being absorbed into the existing structures. And um, so we have the language, for example, the European Union uses the language of, um, uh, so individuals are being empowered, not so much to be protected from the market, but to be empowered to be more active in the market and active in the labor market. And so this is an absolute kind of area of language we see, especially where the sense of crisis 
uh, women are not engaged and they've been paid employment enough. So that, when I talk about the male breadwinner and female care, caregiver, it's not necessarily men and women, it's just the kind of, um, the sort of normative models. To that model, underpinning the employment relationship, we may add also that this normative model is premised on white male employment in the primary labour market. Much else, the inequality bargaining power between the worker and the employing entity, the broader structures within which that bilateral relationship exists, the unpaid work of social reproduction, and or the colonial extraction which makes paid work possible, all of that is invisible for the purposes of the legal formal labour contract. And so I'm kind of compressing a lot there. So just to pause a moment on that which makes and made possible the paid work at the heart of what became the standard employment relationship. And so the extract that I circulated for people to read, I think we back to it a lot, is uh, Silva Frederici, um, um, Caliban and the Witch, Primitive Accumulation, and I forgot the rest of the title, <laughs> sorry. And also, I didn't circulate this, but another um, work that I use and actually Ivana use as well is Maria Mee's Patriarchy and Accumulation on World Scale, mm -hmm. Women in the International Division of Labour. Um, so, um, Silva Federici and Maria Mies and other feminist um, economists analyzes the enclosure of previously common land and resulting dispossession of peasants historically, whose exclusion from access to productive resources is necessitated a return to wage labor. Obviously, not just how you said, but this is absolutely the basis of analysis of primitive accumulation. Um, the dispossession re requiring those who had, were separated from subsistence productive resources having to alienate their own power. I can't believe I spoke for 10 minutes rightly. Mm -hmm. But since the emergent money economy had an asymmetrical impact on women who were increasingly compliant to re reproductive labour at the very time when such work was being devalued. So the point I wish to make is that there is a useful, helpful, conceptual comparison between gender and race, but actually it's more than just metaphorical, they are intertwined. So the point I want to make here is to connect enclosure within the confines of the nation state and include overseas or colonial exposure and dispossession, that both are implicated in the move to wage labour and hence the law regulating waged work. So, um, so what I'm saying is there's a sort of parallel um, to the kind of social reproduction story in elements, ways of understanding racial capitalism, in the way socialist families have theorized the process of social reproduction point, they point out that the counter capitalism that focus only on waged workers' relationships with capitalists are necessarily incomplete because behind the sphere of production where this encounter takes place, there has to be the sphere of reproduction where another kind of labor takes place. The work needs to ensure waged workers nurtured and replenished. And the point that we see Silver Patricia and Maria Mies also bringing together is the parallel between um, social reduction and um, overseas extraction. Both are implicated uh, in the move to wage labour. Both are necessary, but invisibilized in the law regulating work. So um, Gargi um, Bhattacharya <coughs> summarizes Frederici's as saying, colonial exploitation is a parallel process to the invisibilization of women in their work. So labor or labor power accumulated through colonialism and the slave trade made possible a mode of production which could not be achieved solely within Europe. And as Maria Mies points out, she connects the erasure of women's work with the non-wage labor, connects the non-wage labor of women with that of other non-wage workers, enslaved people, contract or indentured workers, peasants in the colonies, arguing that without the ongoing subsistence production of non-wage laborers, wage labor would not be productive. And so the insight here is that non-wage work, colonial exploitation, migrant work, and the work of racialized others was key to fueling the industrial revolution. And I, that is my starting point. And then I sort of fast forward to say that um, this is not acknowledged in the standard narrative of the emergence of the kind of standard employment relationship, but it also serves to hide the ways in which race and colonialism are constitutive, have been always been constitutive of the work relations, but are also constitutive of the contemporary labour market. And so uh, as a kind of quick example, 
two examples I use. One is, um, when I say post-war, I mean post-Second World War um, labour market in terms of where workers who um, might have had been on the geographic periphery, um, but whose labour was subject to colonial extraction. Um, in the context of, let's say, UK labour migration policy, moved to the geographic core, moved to the metropole. They were not necessarily migrants in the context of the United Kingdom. Um, legislation in 1948 introduced a new status of subject of the British Empire. So the British Empire was still quite large in 1948, but that included um, subjects of newly independent states such as Canada, but also subjects of existing colonies such as Jamaica. And so overnight, the 1948 British Nationality Act, it didn't intend to, but had the consequence of creating an, inter uh, creating an internal market for labor across the British empire and former empires. And so those workers whose labor power had been extracted were then located in the geographic core but they remained in the economic periphery of the post-war labour market. And the resonances of that are still felt today um, in that um, they are much more likely to, to be with, to be out with the standard employment relationship. So that's what I mean when I say that the um, racist and colonialism legs are embedded in the legal form, which regulated the emergence of paid work into the sign employment relationship, but it's still ongoing and replicating contemporary precarious work now. Okay, so I'm going to end there. <clears throat> Maybe it makes sense, too. Yeah, it makes sense because it makes sense. Okay. Um, no, thank you. First, they want to thank everyone, uh, the speakers, of course, but also the participants for really rich contributions. Fantastic contributions. Thank you so much. Um, I was kind of imagining this day, um, and I thought, well, it's going to be a very long conversation about similar things, overlapping things from different angles. and. Um, and uh, thank you so much for creating this space. Um, okay, so now I uh, want to follow up on several things that were said uh, today. Um, so one, uh, how do we show the centrality of gender uh, in legal economic structures? Two, uh, address point on uh, how do we show differentiation processes uh, in law? Um, and how law structures the economy by enforcing hierarchies. Um, and finally, something that everyone, I think, in every panel we touch upon is, well, how law structures the reproduction of life. And so I want to present something that I'm working on right now that 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 um, builds on my on my previous work that uh, that Diamond just mentioned. So the current research really tries to analyze in a comp comprehensive way uh, how uh, law regulates, EU law regulates social reproduction. So activities such as bearing children, uh, giving them birth, taking care of them, cleaning, cooking, in other ways, taking care of communities so that individuals and communities can flourish. Um, and that work, work is gendered, it is primarily done uh, by women. And this kind of research uh, questioning has been inspired by materialist feminists. Uh, uh, so Diamond mentioned, of course, Federici, but there are others, uh, Mias, uh, Fraser, um, uh, Patacharaya, um, that you just mentioned. Uh, so for for several decades, what they what they've been uh, what they've been arguing for several decades the, the, the materialist feminist is that this reproductive labor, which is usually treated as non-economic, actually has value and actually is essential to the functioning of capitalism and now neoliberalism. So that's the first point. The second point that Diamond just mentioned is that that kind of labor was always gendered, but was also racialized, right? You cannot disentangle the processes of 
uh, 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 creation of this gender inequality. So that's the main point that Federici ma makes in her in her text, uh, Caliban and the Witch, from colonization processes. So these are kind of the the, the two things. There are other, but I'll just um, sort of these two are important to sort of frame the debate now. In the EU, uh, the dominant EU legal interventions quote social reproduction as care. And to be even more specific, as um, well as the regulation of care. Um, and since the 70s, so first the EU is perceived as a forerunner globally. And as many of you know, since the 70s, it has adopted um, host of legislation, series of measures to address gender inequalities in the market um, in connection to pregnancy or to form of discriminations that working parents, mothers uh, uh, face. Um, it adopted legislation um, and um, uh, policy. So more, more, more um, sorry, more recently it adopted a work-life balance directive in 2019 that recognized for the first time uh, a parental, second parent, paternity um, leave, okay? uh, paternity, second parent uh, leave. And the idea was to try through law to change also the dynamics within the household, right? So sort of shift the burdens and, um, um, and um, change the unequal distribution um, of, of, the, of that labor in the household. And recently, the EU adopted a new care strategy where it recognized what feminists have been saying for five decades now, that care is crucial for societies, that care infrastructures are inadequate. And in an, in a, it announced a series of measures uh, that and, and framework policy policies and, and frameworks that will ensure that within member states, people have access to affordable, accessible care services and better working co conditions and um, uh, better work-life balance for cares. Now, there seems to be a consensus within the EU that, and within EU legal scholarship, that overall, and despite all the loopholes, this is a step in the right direction, that this will ensure gender equality, that this is good for women, it is good for the economy, it's a win-win situation, um, um, and that it will, it legally recognizes, not only legally, but economically recognizes the importance of care uh, within our uh, society. And so what I do in my work is that I try to interrogate these progressive and universal narrative and the meaning of gender justice that actually EU law produces and legitimizes. In the piece that uh, Diamond mentioned um, that I shared with, with you, one of the claims that I make is that these work-life balance measures became progressively central to the EU economic growth and central in legitimizing the neoliberal logic. Um, they are economic tools that primarily address fiscal constraints. They ensure high rates of employment for highly qualified women and minimize or designed to minimize, the idea is to minimize social, women's social exclusion by retaining them in the labor market. So it is not the welfare state that needs to step in. It is the market as, 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 as Diamond uh, summarized that basically will provide uh, the safety net. So there's a complete sort of shift in the logic uh, in neoliberalism. Uh, so the law primarily focuses, uh, uh, focuses on designing the system for recognizing uh, and valuing the care provided by highly educated women in order to ensure economic growth. So it is the reproductive work is very much dependent on productive work. And in, in the uh, current research, I try to push this further and zoom in on processes of differentiation that happen when we look at EU laws and policies across fields. So welfare, citizenship, economic law, uh, equality law together. Um, and I do that in relation to three figures of carers, the balanced woman, uh, the EU migrant carer, and the non-EU carer. 
So these three are sort of tentative descriptions of identities produced by law, by EU law, and by regulatory regimes. These are not an exhaustive list of essentialized, internally coherent subjects of the law. And we could actually, I'm, I'm working now on another piece of the puzzle, which would be the polluting mother, what happened with social reproduction, um, you know, in the context of the ecological crisis, right? So these are sort of the three uh, figures of cares that I, I, I work with. And they are really, I see them as entry points for assessing how social reproduction is regulated, how EU law makes different cares differently precarious while differently valuing their social reproduction based on race, ethnicity, and class. So in other words, try to look at how the EU law underpins a stratified understanding of social reproduction. Um, and I'll briefly say a few words about each of these, each of these figures. So the balanced woman, I think we're most of us are familiar with that, that one. Um, under neoliberalism, the balanced woman became the horizon of progressive politics. As the same time as motherhood uh, became the main focus of technological and economic investment. She provides, so the balanced woman, provides the essential labor of social reproduction in a context of welfare state retreat and privatization that put more pressure on cures while at the same time legitimizing the logic, but also providing sort of effective vocabularies within neoliberalism. Um, as many feminists have showed, this figure of balanced women has enforced the depoliticized and individualized notion of gender equality and a heteronormative, racialized, and classist understanding of legal and political institution of motherhood. Um, and within the EU, what, what I see uh, working through the, through the uh, you know, documents and doing the nitty gritty work that we talked about this morning, what I see is that actually this idea of balance, this emphasis on ba balance in EU law and discourses, which evokes a, sort of a kind of equilibrium between family and market spheres, between uh, unpaid and paid work, private and public spaces, actually erases or downplays the precariousness of motherhood. Um, in other words, it downplays the ways in which EU law itself undermines the very condition of social reproduction. Um, so while to a large extent, EU law offers many legal production protections to address the financial and social penalties that shape legal uh, motherhood. Um, recent court decisions, to use the name by Gaji Bhattacharya, create various forms of these edge populations within capitalism and reinforce precariousness in relation to pregnancy, uh, in, and economic benefits for working care. So here I'm thinking about pension prices. And they also enforce <coughs> racialization processes by, for instance, undermining the legal protection, um, um, making Muslim female workers carers wearing the veil um, more precarious. So right now in the EU, it is fairly easy for a corporation to fire an uh, uh, employer wearing the Muslim veil uh, if that firm has a sort of neutrality policy. So these are all the ways in which EU law undermines the very possibilities of repro reproducing, reproduction of life for certain categories. Um, and then we can also said so Kati this morning mentioned some of that, but I see it in my work to a large extent. This idea of balance also work by balanced uh, 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 this idea of balanced women also raises Western Eastern dynamics or center periphery dynamics in the EU. Um, so we know that in socialist and communist countries, child infrastructures were quite robust. I'm not saying that everything was perfect when it comes to gender equality, far from that, but we know that. So what does it mean to talk about balance 
right now in the EU in a context in which neoliberal reforms imposed by the EU when these countries joined undermine material possibilities of social reproduction. Um, second, okay, second, the EU migrant care. Um, so here I turn to EU citizenship law and, and court decisions. Um, and this allows us to appreciate how the status of these carers, so EU migrant carer, um, EU, so I'm talking about EU citizens that travel across right, uh, the EU, how their uh, status is both similar and different from the one of the balanced women. So again, appreciating the processes and, and, and describing these pro processes of differentiation. Um, and recent shifts, um, what allows us to appreciate that is that uh, the recent shift that happened in EU citizenship law. So basically, uh, residency status and the allocation of social benefits is now dependent on a very narrow, narrow understanding of productive work. Um, and in a series of decision, the court has effectively undermined EU migrant carers' legal citizenship and welfare rights creating a differenti differentiating processes based on gender and class. Um, so these decisions directly make precarious those migrant carers, so EU migrant carers, who move from formal and informal labor. Market. Um, reproductive work also is not, first is not work according to the court of justice. So the EU citizens cannot claim welfare benefits based on that. And reproductive work by these migrant carers can only be recognized if it is connected to the needs of the market. So we, I teach that in Annette's class, this case, um, a pregnant EU migrant worker who stopped working because of pregnancy and who's asking for unemployment benefits can only be recognized as a worker if her absence from the mar market was minimal, or as the court says, because she never, quote, ceased to belong to the market. Okay, and finally, the third country national. Um, so like other parts of the global north, the EU relies on the underpaid and precarious domestic uh, work of mostly women from the global south or, or EU's periphery. And it is when they perform this domestic work for the benefits of EU citizens that their reproductive labor is truly recognized and valued. So now I'm thinking about the work of materialist feminists such as Sarah Ferris, uh, who showed us several years ago how EU non-migrant, non-Western workers, uh, often from formerly colonized uh, territories, have been for long time channeled into poorly paid, low skilled jobs in the care sector in application of EU law and EU policies. And the same logic is exemplified in some landmark cases by the court uh, involving Filipino, per Peruvian and Ukrainian care carers, where the court found that these non-EU citizen could be legally protected because they take care of EU citizen dependents. So not granting them residence rights, that was at stake here, would undermine EU citizens' economic freedom. And so you see how first the court says, well, the smooth functioning, quote unquote, of the internal market depends on this sort of reproductive work. Two, um, on the one hand, it protects them by saying we're gonna rent, you know, you're gonna get residence rights based on the work that you're doing. At the same time, it enforces dependency on EU citizens and the fact that they're performing mostly unpaid in this situation uh, work for them. And the new European care strategy that was adopted last year exemplifies the sim a similar logic. So the commission acknowledges that working conditions in the care sector are often exploitative and precarious, precarious that there are shortages, um, and suggests as a response 
well, yes, let's uh, improve these conditions. It's a long, you know, long term project. But also let's create special schemes for immigrants. Uh, for, in for instance, and I quote the commission, those fleeing the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Uh, here, the commission says, well, this could be a win-win situation because it's an opportunity for them to work. And it's an opportunity for us to meet uh, the demands for, for jobs in this, uh, in, in this sector, demands in the sector. Okay, so I'm going to conclude. Uh, in EU law, uh, what, what I tried to show here is how in EU law, reproductive work is gendered. It is also racialized, defined by ethnicity and class. And it is tightly connected to productive work. So it is recognized when it is attached to productive work and the economic rationale. We need to create more jobs, we need more jobs. Therefore, we're gonna create these schemes that will allow people to enter in the market or for other people to help these balanced women uh, uh, enter the market and stay in the market. And what I also tried to show here is how this reproductive labor is part of the story, is very di differently valued. Uh, and it is stratified. So we cannot really tell the full story without looking at how neoliberalism works in connection to gender, race, ethnicity, and class. So that's my sort of show it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, then. Thank you. Wow. I'm afraid for your sins, you will come back to the 18th century now. And it's <laughs> not, uh, I really think it's important. It's, so the piece that, the, the piece, the, the, my work that, that I'm going to present now is published, or is going to be published later this year, uh, in an edited collection that talks about futures of work. And one of my clear struggles with it, from the context of this early 18th century, in which I look at, is to actually accept that there is such a linearity in which we talk about certain pasts and certain presents and then certain futures in almost seamless manner. So what I really want to talk instead is a temporality of work. Uh, but I'll do this through, through an example to make things somewhat more clear, I hope. Uh, the way which Rob had done before us, uh, I think it's important to come back to these sites of, well, against violence, but also immense types of collaboration and resistance that uh, have crossed the boundaries that were just about to be made for people. They have actively resisted these boundaries. And these stories are very rarely told. So I think at least the, you know, one, of the, one of the tasks of a critical historian is tell better stories in that sense, to be able to tell those stories and to show how they continue to be relevant. But one of the ways I think particularly that they continue to be relevant is the way in which certain categories of personhood that have been quite literally voiced on people as they were doing so. Uh, they would have been negotiated, uh, they would have been resisted, they would have been worked with in ways that, that tell us something about the types of uh, solidarity, understanding, care, and so on, things that are, you know, in feminist and queer studies at least of key importance. So, so, so these are the types of stories I always focus on. And uh, that's not to romanticize resistance, uh, but it's also not to say that even if certain so-called quote unquote failed attempts to resist, as sometimes they're rendered in mainstream histories, if we don't tell those stories, we risk really uh, uh, not understanding the extent to which what the, the types of the world, the types of, again, words we use in this language. Immensely violent way in which those things were framed. So the, 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 the epistemic violence that we all partake in by using terms that we do, such as race and gender. Uh, the extremely important, I think, to always go back to in the ways in which they were being forged. So that's what I'm going to try to do in this couple of minutes, but talking about kind of back of town alliances and types of laboring resistance in early French colonial New Orleans. So I no longer talk about uh, 
so-called pre-colonial uh, proto-colonial Senegambia, but I'm still talking about people that I follow uh, across the Middle Passage as they end up in early uh, French colonial New Orleans. So in the context of my current work, uh, which is, as I mentioned this morning, concerns the temporality and self of gender non-conforming Senegambians who were forcibly brought to colonial Louisiana in the 18th century, I studied how labor figured in the making of a racial capitalist plantation economy. And I'm really interested in, not only in the imposition of dehumanizing hard work and starkly hierarchical economic relations by the new colonial elite, including through colonial law, but also in the way slavery could be both used and refused by the plural underclasses that emerged in and around New Orleans, so as to undermine and resist the emergent colonial system, including its attendant racialized gender bias. So as of 1721, uh, more than two thirds of the free households in New Orleans uh, contained enslaved people, the majority of whom were brought from Senegambia. To quote an authoritative source, many of these individuals, quote, brought skill as well as brawn, having quickly monopolized the colony's artisanal sector, end quote. So cabinet maker, blacksmith, metal worker, carpenter, and hooper were just some of the highly sought after professions which members of the Senegambia artisanal status group uh, could easily excel in. And it is precisely this status group that features most prominently in my research for its many cosmological and social forms of gender non-conformity. So as their collective name in Mandel languages, Yamakala, suggests, uh, members of artisanal groups were brought to possess, well, were thought to possess extraordinary access to the foundation of life force, or Nyama, and be the beings with their own special temporality, access to history and bodily and gender varying properties. The Nyamakala, or in Wolof uh, Nyenyo, in Fokso de Nyenyo, occupied a deeply ambiguous position in society and were contradictorily described as feared, as loaded, desired, necessary, respected all at the same time. Uh, so they ordinarily made their living through specialized services they provided to the rest of the Senegambian population. Numerous subdivisions existed. For example, among the Mandanyamakala, Numu typically worked in metal, wood and earth, and the Garan Kim in leather. Uh, but as I briefly mentioned this morning, the most famous and idiosyncratic of all were Jaliu, known as Griots, whose specific artistry, or Jalia, uh, extended wide and deep from music, dance, companionship to warriors, and advice to nobles and local leaders to the art of oral history proper with its many mystical properties. As a consequence of the influx of the enslaved Namakala, wages of free skilled labor force in New Orleans and throughout the colony began to fall dramatically until some professions were nearly devoid of any such workers. Senegambian blacksmiths of the move, uh, in particular seem to have managed to forge a distinct identity and could be traced in the colonial archive for decades to come. According to an estimate in 1726, the presumed racial composition of rural rate laborers in Lower Louisiana was 85% West African. So such a force was difficult to control and quickly immersed itself into the strong undercurrent of indigenous and lower class resistance. Because the, the company the zone, the, uh, in charge of capitalist extraction in French Louisiana insisted on charging a very high price for the enslaved, it had to provide a variety of options for an aspiring class of local planters, including to quote again, uh, uh, requiring slave owners to relinquish their slaves for one month each year to work on public projects, especially in New Orleans. And this allowed the enslaved, many of whom at any rate lived on plantations within 13 miles mile around the city center, to join the company workers enslaved or free engaged in the variety of urban labor. Many enslaved were also allowed one or two days in a week to work for themselves, sell or exchange produce at the city markets or be hired as laborers. So the adjacency of urban and rural settlements and life enabled mixing among the enslaved and all other lower class laborers and for the former to access certain forms of paid work that would ordinarily be seen as contrary to their formal legal status. Uh, the terrain of a series of natural and human-made levees divided by a fetid swamp, also provided for fast and if necessary, clandestine contact. So the enslaved, quote, could reach New Orleans by paddling through the swamps almost as swiftly as Abiton could be, by, could, 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 be, could be there by riverboat, often in five or 10 minutes in coming downstream. Uh, 
This made the capital city an epicenter of social life and the forms of labor and intimacy that were seen as disorderly and dangerous to the colony. And one such a form was the perceived lack of work. So city and state officials constantly complained to Paris and among themselves about the menace of the unemployed, especially if they were forced or forced immigrants and former engagés or, or indentured servants. Uh, a French bureaucrat claimed, for example, that, quote, the rear of the city is infested with numbers of men without profession who adulterate the liquors they sell illegally and expose the enslaved to violent maladies in their makeshift unlicensed taverns. And then they, 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 they complete this report with, with this exclamation point, what hidden pernicious disorders have resulted? So those illegal venues tucked away in the interior, more explicitly racially diverse in four parts of New Orleans, served as chief meeting places for the city's lower class laborers, which included the ostensibly unemployed sex workers and the enslaved. And crucially, along with many Louisiana swamps, the taverns buttressed underground resistance networks leading to conspiracies and rebellions, including some in which the indigenous, the enslaved, and the lower class formerly indentured servants joined forces to fight the racial capitalist system in the making. So foremost of such events was the 1729 Natchez uprising, which nearly put an end to the colony and significantly altered the local dynamics of the French imperial project. Uh, the destruction of the French village at the Foc Rosalie uh, bankrupted the company des Andes, severely shook metropolitan investors' confidence in the colony's tobacco production capabilities, and as a result, two years later, virtually brought the transatlantic influx of the enslaved into Louisiana to an end. It took another empire, that of the Spanish, and some 40 years before this ignominious trade could be resumed in any greater numbers there. And meanwhile, New Orleans' back of town remained a hub for the poor and the non-conforming, while the swamps harbored an increasing number of fugitives. Thus, various forms of interactionary life and labor continued their pace. So in some a colonial, in colonial New Orleans and its vital surrounding environs, uh, labor mattered when it was imposed as much as when it was resisted in its cheap and possessive mode. Its simultaneous presences and absences when one was to steal oneself, to use a poignant local phrase, from dehumanizing toil, but for a brief moment, only to engage in would be disorderly forms of labor and intimacy, or when one subsisted in the guise of an idler, working towards a back of town space for self-expression and dangerous mingling, disrupted the terrain of Louisiana's racial capitalist economy and legality. Some such interruptions yeah. have been momentary. Mainstream historian accounts rarely mention them or see them as successful. Nonetheless, they have. Because and sometimes despite the colonial archive, their, their presence lingers on unsettling the presumptive delineations of work, its absence, and of colonial labors in human social theory. So my proposal then is to study the commingling practices of work, gendering, and racialization, not only through the ways in which they were imposed, for instance, in colonial law, but also through the many ways they were subverted and resisted as violent and, and dispossessive, especially with respect to the laborers' perceived forms of embodiment and personhood. So this might provide an important corrective in our understanding of colonial labor relations and uncover numerous labor-related practices of anti-colonial resistance. There is no doubt danger in romanticizing such practices that in turn risks relativizing the immense systemic violence at the heart of the racial capitalist project, past and present, but it is equally problematic to downplay and paint as ultimately unsuccessful and therefore insignificant the ways laborers, enslaved, indentured, and formerly free sought to navigate and interrupt the prescribed tools, uh, including through alliances that sometimes defy the logics of the colonial racialized gender violence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would stick to the schedule. We nearly have to end this session. But what I want to do, I have, I have uh, two small questions. Uh, one is on the concept of enclosure.